everyone. Wow. Another good live program. I am <laughs> A really good so program. So excited. We both are. You don't have any idea what might happen on this program. So True. just tie yourself to the chair <laughs> and watch. And we've got Kenny Hope is going to sing for us today. But it's just going to be a wow, wow program. Okay? And uh, he's written a book. Pat Schatzline. Yeah, I guess <laughs> I, you ought to give his name. Uh, written a book, Rebuilding the Altar. And Kenny Hope is going to start the program, The Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him, yeah. 
such a joy to have Pat with yes. us. I'm so honored to be with you guys. I just God love you so you. much. Well, we love you too. And we're just so thankful, honestly and truly, that you wrote this book. You know, when, when, God, wow. when God spoke to Karen and I that we had to write this, and, and uh, the, uh, when God began to burn in our spirits, you've got to write. In fact, I've got to give you the, the, the finished version because uh, when God said you're going to write this, boy, we fought some wars to write it but it is setting lives free. Mm. People are, I mean, every day, we can't get through the first two pages without weeping. Husbands and wives, pastors calling me saying, I have to repent. And I'm saying, for what? Because I got away from the altar. Mm. Wow. Got away from the altar. And so it's awakening a bride is what it's doing. You know, when we're born, they dedicate us at the altar. When we get married, we meet at the altar. When we die, they put our caskets by the altar. It's Why true. don't we visit in between? Amen. 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 Wow, well, I got to remember that. And that's so, good. That's what the Lord spoke to us. He said, you're going to restore the altars in America. And, and the altar is not a piece of wood. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. But Jesus, Amen. Jesus became the altar. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, talk. We've got something here that <laughs> I don't know exactly what this is all about, but it's about the altar. What you know, happens at the altar? <laughs> you know, the Lord spoke to Karen and I, and uh, when we wrote this, and He said, "You're going to, you're going to take altars across America." And I'm like, "Lord, we're evangelists. We've traveled two and a half million miles. We lead the I Am Remnant movement all over the world." And the Lord said, "You're going to carry altars." I said, "Well, number one, God, that's not practical," and I said, "Number two, it's offensive." And he said, no, you'll take these to places that are ready for revival and ready for harvest. Wow. So before we came here to CTN to be with y'all, uh, I went to prayer. Karen and I both went to prayer and we said, Lord, and she would be here today, but it's the first day of school. And um, uh, there's the very few couples that have ever wrote a book together, especially about revival and, uh, and about the awakening. But God told us to, and we've been married 27 years. But the Lord spoke to us and, and said, you're going to carry altars to places that are desperate for move of God. And so before I came here, I began to pray and I said, Lord, do I take one to CTN? And the Lord said, yes. He said, mm -hmm. as a gift to you for your home to pass on to generations. And now the vision is to put 10,000 of these in parks, at universities. We're going to go in stealth. We're going to drop them off in the middle of the night for people to have places to meet him again. Yeah. Place of encounter. That's what the altar is. It's Amen. the meeting place. Amen. When I heard about these, I told you in the green room, I prayed. <laughs> I said, Lord, I want one of those altars so bad. Can we please have one of those altars? And wow, when you said, I have a gift for you, and I looked over and saw that, I thought, Lord, you answered my prayer. Thank you so much. And, and, and it's because the two of you are, are handpicked by the Lord, and it's what the Lord spoke to me prophetically when I walked into the building today. The Lord said, tell them I'm not done. See, I believe there's an outbreak of God coming to Christian television. Yes. Amen. And it's a restoration heart of cry. purity. It's a re restoration of integrity. It's a restoration of holiness. It's a restoration of the holy call back to God. And I had a prophetic dream that it would break loose on a Christian television set. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lord, what was that? I woke up the next morning. Karen and I have a sleep disorder called Revelation. <laughs> and, and we write about it in Revealed in the Altar that he'll give us prophetic dreams. And many times we, he even showed us who was going to win the presidency th uh, three weeks before. And uh, uh, many times... She'll have it first, and then I'll have it. Or I'll have it first, then she'll have it. And we'll be in prayer, and we'll be talking. I'll say, let me tell you what the Lord showed me. And she'll go, I had the same dream. And she'll pull out her prayer journal and see where she wrote it down. But I really feel with all my heart as I walked in today that God is going to use CTN in another level, in another way, supernaturally around the world, to awaken the bride, to bring in the prodigals. And, and, and it's happening. Hmm. Yeah, it is. I believe. Well, can, I would just like to read this because, you know, I really saw the heart of these two people. When I read the page, one page, that was, 
our prayer for you. And this is their prayer for you and for us, that we would be altered and undone at the altar. I'm gonna find where it is. That we would be awakened to our purpose and destiny, that we would be drawn into a deeper encounter with God, and that we would abandon complacency and compromise, and that we would be consumed by God and set a place for something bigger than ourselves. That's it. Hard to read. Mm. That's it. Yeah. It's Hebrews 12. The, the very last chapter of the book is called It's Time to Burn. And it just says, you'll never burn so bright until first you crawl back to the altar of encounter. You know, Revelation 6 says that the martyrs are under the altar. And I was praying one morning. I said, Lord, all the martyrs, anyone that's died around the world for Christ is under the altar waiting. And I said, Lord, why are they there? He said to hear the prayers of the saints. But right now the heavens are quiet. See, this is an Isaiah 58, verse 1, cry aloud and spare not book. It's a holy call for your family, for your children, for desperation to break out. To, you know, if you don't prophesy over your children, the enemy will tell them who they're not, and he'll speak death over them. And seeing the move of God, of getting back to that place of saying, tie me to the altar, tie me back to your encounter, tie me back to your presence. And when we wrote this, if I can share... We, we really went through some battles to write it. I lost my voice for six weeks. My little girl began to lose her hearing. My wife began to get sick as we were writing. And the, I was on my knees one day and I said, Lord, I don't know if we can write this. Because we had written I Am Remnant and Dehydrated and all the other books. And the Lord spoke to me, said, okay, I'll find someone else. Mm -hmm. And I started weeping and I said, but Lord, I'll be a man without a church if I write this book. And he said, Pat, I'd rather be a man without a church than a bridegroom without a bride. You do my bidding. Wow. And the great awakening that is coming, the move of the spirit that is coming, I, I get weepy because I feel him walk in and I felt like he walked in a minute ago. It, what we don't understand, the first altar call after the cross was when Jesus is walking with the disciples. They don't realize it's him. They're discouraged. They're defeated. He walks up and says, what are you talking about? And they go, are you? I mean, they were condescending to Jesus. Where you been at, buddy? They crucified the master. We're going to Emmaus, which was Warm Springs. They were going on vacation. They were disappearing. They are known as revolutionists. Their pictures are up in the post office. And Jesus starts giving his resume. They didn't wake up to it. He goes from Moses through the prophets of who he is. They still didn't know it was him. And then the Bible says they come to a crossroads and he starts to turn. And as he starts to turn, they said, oh, please stay. And he comes back to them sits down at the table, breaks the bread, and their eyes are open, and he disappears. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us? The church needs to know in America where we're at. He's been trying to tell them who he is. But if the church does, and you can do this in your home right now, and you better watch out because the glory is going to hit you. If you'll begin to cry out, please stay, please stay, you'll have an encounter with God, and your heart will begin to burn. Amen. You know, there's a poem... When you say that, remind me, I just wrote a little bit down this poem. If Jesus came to your house today, I'm sorry, if Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you'd do. And it's a long, so I won't go on, but it's good. You need to go on the internet. Could you let Jesus walk right in or would you rush about? And that meant, would you hide magazines? Would you ask friends that you shouldn't be running around with to leave real quick? Right. Would he want to stay? Would you want him to stay for more than two or three days? Would he feel comfortable there? Would you feel comfortable wow. with him there? It's a powerful, powerful poem. Wow. I'm telling you, I used to read it to my kids all the time. And wow. I went on the internet just to see if it was still around because I couldn't find it anymore. And I, all I typed in was, of the book. if Jesus came <laughs> to your house today, that's all you have to type in. Wow. <laughs> well, I, you know, and, and I'm going to tell you, I always say that when I get to heaven, I don't want my lifestyle to change. I believe we're called to be mobile upper rooms. I believe that wherever you walk in, demons ought to be diving out windows. You know, we see miracles all the time every week, scars disappearing off cutters, deaf ears opening. We see a lot of crazy supernatural miracles. And the Lord has always told me, he said, if you ever take credit for it, I'll stop. And it, that it's him, it's him, it's him. Mm -hmm. the, the, when we began to write this book, it, it started with... My son was a senior in high school. He was being recruited for football. My beautiful little girl, Abigail, we adopted her from China when she was uh, nine months old. And 
And I'll never forget, Nate's a senior in high school, and one morning they're getting ready for school, and all of a sudden Nate goes, Dad, somebody's on the back porch. Abby goes, Daddy, somebody's on the back porch. Karen said, Pat, somebody's on the back porch. And I turned, and we have a privacy fence, and I see a hooded man standing on my back deck. And I ran out the door. I'm a redneck. I'm ready to go. Let's go. <laughs> I ran out the door, and uh, he was gone. And the Lord said to me, he said, Satan's visiting. Go to war. We had gotten so busy doing ministry, because if the devil can't make you sin, he'll just make you busy. Yeah. Yeah. So busy traveling the world, preaching the gospel, that we had let, we had quit building the altar in our home. And that started us on our journey that would eventually lead to writing, rebuilding the altar. Because God said, and that we did. We went to war, began to have prophetic dreams, realized our son was in trouble spiritually. He calls us <laughs> one morning, Karen and I both had a dream. He said, Mom and Dad, I've been into this. And now he leads one of the largest youth ministries in the world. But you've got to take your family back. You gotta restore your home. You gotta restore your marriage. You gotta lay, and lay yourself back at his feet. Tell us what your publisher said about that book. Well, I'll be careful, but yeah, they were, be careful. Uh, one, one of the uh, <laughs> things was they were just worried that no one would would buy it. They said people don't buy books to repent anymore. Uh, the particular person that emailed me, and and I said, well, they need to quit buying the Bible then, and. Uh, then the Spirit of the Lord showed them, and it was October 3rd of 2016, Feast of Trumpets, <laughs> Jewish New Year, 5777. The number seven is Zion in the Hebrew uh, number, and it means cr uh, crown and sword. It's when you take back what you're, that's the year we're in right now. And they said, the Lord said you're supposed to write this. And the Lord spoke to us, and that was the very day, it was October 3rd, that by that night I had lost my voice. It was like something clamped onto me. And I'm in a service preaching and a precious friend, a lady, senior adult lady, walks up to me and the Lord says, six weeks, no voice. I'm an evangelist. I preach in churches every week. I gotta have a voice. And I'm whispering. And this precious lady walks up to me and I had brought an altar with me. And she said, if you'll go lay on your altar, God will heal you. And I went, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do it. I've gotta preach, worship is going. And finally, I just said, I'm desperate. Walked up, laid down on the altar, and I felt this thing let go. Wow. I'm wow. telling you, James 4, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Wash your hands, cleanse your heart. No more double-mindedness. The church must wake up. We have gotten so good where the crowd determines the sermon, the preacher becomes an actor, and the Holy Spirit's locked out in the streets. Our microwave Christianity. And what we've got to realize is God is screaming, let me back into my house. Mm. Let me pour out my spirit. Mm. Well, if not, yeah. it'll be in the streets. Yes, it will. <laughs> if it's not in the church, yeah. it'll be. It'll be in the streets. They're, they're desperate. Yeah. This generation is not afraid of the power of the Holy Ghost. I've never met a single teenager who was afraid of getting baptized in fire. I've seen 10,000 this summer come to Christ plus. I've seen it with just, Sid Roth and I were just in the Ukraine. We saw 950 Jews healed, then saved, then filled with the Holy Ghost. They didn't go through a six weeks course on why not to do it. They wow. just got it. God's pouring out. Wow. You and Karen started out as youth pastors and then God spoke to you. You had an encounter with God at 16 years old. Yes. The Lord Jesus walked in your room. Can you talk about that a minute? I, I, I'd love to. You know, my dad was a drug dealer off the streets of Detroit got saved when I was five. He pastored those little tiny churches and uh, they were tough. And so I got angry at the church at a young age, watched my mom have a breakdown, nervous breakdown, a lot of other stuff. Didn't even know I was hearing the voice of the Lord then. He would tell me, go run home, walk in, inter interrupt the enemy trying to kill our family. But at 16 years old, I'm laying in the floor, had no desire to preach the gospel. And uh, if, you, if you don't think, if you have no desire to preach the gospel, you're probably going to end up preaching. <laughs> and uh, the best way to know you're called to preach is to wake up thinking about it, go to bed thinking about it, and everything that happens, you'd be a great sermon illustration. Welcome to the call. And if you ignore it, you'll be a mean board member. But I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm laying on the floor of my bedroom, and I write about it in the book. And I, at three, I, went, I said, God, if you're real, you've got to come show me. And it was my first visitation. And he walked in about three in the morning. And he said, I'm sorry my bride has hurt you but you will bring healing to the bride. And that is when I got saved, 
and accepted the call at 16. Wow. First wow. altar call for me was in the bedroom floor. Wow. True wow. altar call. We're going to take a break for Kenny. He's going to bring another song. <laughs> And I don't know what it is, but it'll be good. It'll be good. It'll be great. <laughs> Kenny, go ahead. Unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave. I am a child of God, yes I am, I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child. Hi. 
child of God. Yes, I am, I am a child of God, full of faith. Oh, I am a child of God, no more fear. Oh, I am a child of God. Thank you, Kenny. I love Kenny Hope. <laughs> You've known him a long time. A long time. We won't tell our age, but we're both grandfathers. So there you go. <laughs> well, you're younger than us. <laughs> yeah, we're not great grandparents yet. No, we're not. <laughs> no, we're just grandparents. Yeah. Tell us about your wife and the part of you that she is. You know, Karen is such a gift from the Lord to me. She wrote a book, Dehydrated, that just went global last year. We've been married 27 years, and she's beautiful. I always say it don't matter how ugly you are. As long as you're anointed, God will take care of you. He'll give you a beautiful gift. <laughs> but she travels around the world. She just saw thousands saved in Singapore and in Brazil. And, and we do the I Am Remnant conferences together. When she, I'll, I always do the, I'm the, I'm the breaker, <laughs> anointed. But then she follows me on stage, and the heavens open prophetically. She wrote a chapter in the new book called I Am Revival. She was supposed to speak with me in Tennessee at an event. Our daughter got sick. The minute I got on the plane, our daughter was healed. She said, Lord, why am I at home? I should be preaching with Pat. And sure enough, she went down to our prayer room and the Lord opened the heavens and began to speak to her about the chapter, I Am Revival. I don't have to go to revival. I am revival. Mm. Wow. The same spirit that raised Christ and dead dwells in me that I have the anointing. Jesus, God chose to, or Jesus chose us to reveal himself to the world. And that chapter is wrecking people. Uh, literally, t-shirts are being it's made. I am revival. <laughs> and so that's who Karen, she's my gift from the Lord. And when we wrote this together, that was an amazing moment because it was so peculiar. Chronologically, the Lord would speak to her for a chapter, then he would speak to me. You know, many wow. people write books and they take a stack of sermons and make it into a book. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that with this. It was all directly from the Holy Spirit, downloads that he would drop on us. Wow. And we wrote the book in about three months, that particular book. Well, there are mm -hmm. four parts of revival, the pattern. Drought, the altar, the rain, the harvest. That's it. Now, let's talk about the drought first. What are the signs of a drought? Well, all through God's Word, and you'll get me fired up, if there, the Amos said there's a famine in the land for the word of the Lord. Famine, uh, the drought represents that we're living in the day of false grace teaching. Titus 2, is a, the word grace means to empower you. We're living in a day of celebrity Christianity that are more concerned about followers on social media than back at the cross. We're living in the day where uh, the drought for the word of the Lord. When you see Elijah walk up and say, how long will you waver between two opinions? First Kings chapter 18. It says he rebuilt the altar. It had been a famine for three and a half years. He rebuilds the altar, fire of God hits. He takes off running and then comes the rain. To anoint, you have to have rain to anoint the Elishas, the farmers. Elisha was a farmer. So when you rebuild the altar and there's a famine there, same thing with Amos. Famine land for the word of the Lord, Amos 8. Amos 9, God stands at the altar. Amos 9, 11, the scripture read in the synagogues the day Israel became a nation. The reaper overtakes the plowman. The drought that we're seeing in America is we, have, we know how to do church. But you know, when you, re, when you just have Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures, and you don't have the Holy Spirit, one-third from 100 is 33.3, .3, which leaves the number 66.6. .6. So you kick out the Holy Spirit. You remove one-third of the Trinity. You're now operating the spirit of the Antichrist. And that's what we write about in the book that we are now living in a day where the Holy Spirit is who waters us. The Holy Spirit is who stops, stops the drought and brings in the harvest. So the Lord showed us the pattern. I'll never forget, I was sitting and I text Sid Roth and I said, Sid, God just showed me the pattern for revival. All through God's word, if you, to stop the famine, you must build an altar. Every time wow. the famine stopped, they built an altar, then came the fire of God, blew the dust off the altar. Dust is what we're made of, man's fingerprints. Then comes the rain, then comes the harvest. If we will restore the altar, we'll see churches 
that have been mm -hmm. forgotten on the back roads, churches that once were large, if they'll restore the encounter, wow. those houses will fill back up in for the lost. I'm telling you. I believe it. Wow. We believe that too, don't we, sweetheart? <laughs> We just believe God's really pouring out in these last days, and that's why He's doing all this by His Spirit. He's, a, he's awakening. What the Lord spoke to me when we were writing the book. He said, I will awaken the silent majority, mm -hmm. those that are desperate for the move of God. That's why the book has exploded all over America. Yeah. I mean, where people are saying, I'm having encounters with God. He's hovering over my bed. He woke me up Sunday morning. I was in San Diego this last week, and He woke me up early, and He said, get up, get up. I need to talk to you and began to speak to me about the move of God in San Diego. Here's what you have to know, folks. He still speaks. Mm -hmm. He's still pouring out His glory. I don't want to be a stranger when I get to heaven. Amen. That's right. If someone said to you, my flame is about to go out, what would you say to them? I would tell them the best way to get a flame going again is to breathe upon it. And all through God's Word, there's breathing rooms. The Shunammite woman, Ezekiel 37, 36, then 37, the valley of dry bones. Can these bones live? Ah, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Jesus breathed upon the disciples. They're in the upper room. He said, receive you the Holy Spirit. They were discouraged, defeated. They didn't know where to go. Acts chapter 2, the wind of God. God breathed upon them. I would say the greatest thing you could do right now is wherever you're at, in your car, at work. You know, an altar is not what we think of in, in the front of the church. An altar's in your home, in your car, in the gym, wherever you're at, say, Holy Spirit, breathe upon me, and that flame will begin to roar again. The all-consuming fire of Hebrews 12. Amen. Mm. The altar is when you're in the ocean yeah. and you're going down for the last time. That's right. That's one of the best altars you <laughs> could have. <laughs> well, uh, and I, I believe that with all my heart, you know, when you feel like you're drowning, the best way to know you're drowning is no one can hear your scream but you. But God says, I'll reach down and I'll pull you out of this thing. I'll heal your family. I'll heal your marriage. I'll pour my spirit out. Here's what you have to understand. God's just waiting on you to say, I need you, Jesus. I need you to do something big. What I talked about the two disciples, please stay. Remember, he walked up to the man at the pool of Bethesda. He walks through the sheep gate, which the first gate Nehemiah had rebuilt when they rebuilt the altar, Ezra and Zerubbabel. That's why Nehemiah had to climb through the garbage of the city after 50 years, rebuilt the altar. Then they built the walls. You, you'll never build the wall until you build the altar. But Jesus comes walking up and see, we, we wrote a chapter called When Tomorrow Becomes Today. Some of you or that are watching right now, well, someday I'll have my encounter. Someday I'll fix this. Someday I'll break that habit. Someday I'll, today's your day. Jesus walks up to the man, pool of Bethesda, 38 years. Number 38 is the number of slavery. He has every complaint in the book. He says, everybody gets in the way when the angel comes to stir the water, which was a myth. But there was five colonnades. Each person separated. If you were blind, you're over here. If you're crippled over here. And Jesus said, hey, do you want to be made whole or not? Get up, take up your mat. Later finds him in the synagogue and says, quit talking trash or you're going to be sicker than before. It was the altar call at the, at the city pool. You can have an altar call at the city pool and God will move. What people don't understand is Jesus met a demon-possessed man after a storm on the shore. He spoke the word peace and it shot across the water and that man came running down to find peace. It was an altar call on the shore. That man will become a great evangelist. Don't matter where you're at. If you're on an army base watching this, military base, if you're in a foreign nation, if you're in a nation where it's illegal to hear the name Jesus, you don't have to go find a church. The altar call can be right there in your bedroom to fall on your knees. My dad's first altar call, drug dealer, never saved, no one in our family saved, was a toilet on his knees at a toilet in Detroit. He said, God save me. And it started a revolution in our family. Praise mm. God. Well, why do you think so many churches don't have altar calls? They don't call people to the altar. That, I think that is why we wrote the book the most. Because we've learned to sanctify demons. We've learned to tell people how great they are and mix it with a little bit of humanism and salt it with a little Holy Spirit. And, 
And I think that we've gotten to a place, I'm going to say something that's probably, I'll get attacked for, so for keyboard commandos, get ready. <laughs> uh, that's what I call people that love to talk on Facebook. Um, the Lord began to speak to me as we don't bring people down front anymore or give the invitation for the encounter because we love microwave Christianity and I get it. I pastored a church, we were in three services and I, we got to get people in and out. I get the parking lot issues, I get all that. I promise you, I get it. But the Lord began to speak to me that we are sending them home without the encounter and the most full the church will ever be will be the day after the rapture. When people will come running saying, why didn't you tell me? But as things get intense, the churches that are not preaching Truth, and in, truth is a new hate speech, and the enemy of truth is silence. They're not preaching truth, truth about, truth about Matthew 19 marriage, about unborn children, about the place of the encounter, about identity. If they don't get back to it, they're going to empty out. We're going to have a lot of hollow buildings in America because God will walk by them. But back to your amazing question, and that is, I think they don't do it anymore because if we bring people down, they might see the flaws in our armor. Yeah. Mm. But if you'll get them down, give them the place. If it's three minutes, they didn't come to hear us speak. They didn't come to celebrate our singing. And I love worship and I love preaching. I love all of it. I know. They came to get healed. Nehemiah couldn't get through the city, burned up Jerusalem because of all the garbage at the gate. Let's move all the garbage out of the way and give them the place of the encounter. Thanks. Psalms 118, 27 says, <laughs> I have to be careful. <laughs> yeah, let's they, talk they about this. <laughs> Psalms 118, 27, a friend of mine, Dr. Mark Spitzbergen, walked up to me two years ago after our international board meeting where people come in and they pour into us, they check our finances, they pour into Karen and I, and he walks up to me at the end of the board meeting and he said, Pat, the Lord says he wants to tie you to the altar. And I went, what? And then the, I, so I get home, I begin to study, and I go to Psalms 118, 27. That's what's on the end of your altar. It says, tie me to the horns of the altar. Well, what is the New Testament scripture of that? The love of God constrains me. It means I have boundaries. It's John 15. He's the vine, I'm the branch. And so the Lord began to speak to me. Son, this was the beginning of this whole thing that would lead to rebuild, writing the book, Rebuilding the Altar. The Lord began to say to me, I'm going to tie you back to me. I'm going to tie you back to my encounter. It's not about ministry. It's... It's not about people or plaudits or platforms. It's about being tied back to Him. He is the altar. Hebrews 10 says His body became the doorway to the altar. Hebrews 13 says Jesus became the altar upon our hearts. We must get tied back to Him. Amen. When I preach this at churches, <laughs> people come running down and they'll grab the rope and just wrap <laughs> themselves in it. It's crazy. Forgive me, I had a... I get lost in that. It isn't crazy. It's the truth. Amen. And the truth isn't crazy. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's the only thing that makes sense. Yes. I want you to know that we're going to cherish this. Absolutely. And I, just sitting here, I'm going to have some made for our grandkids. I can, I'll, I'll take care of that. No. <laughs> we, we, we actually have started to, families, our dream is to put 10,000 of these. So we launched rebuilding our myfamilyaltar.com for families to put them in their home because they're, if they're not getting it at church, and a lot of churches do have the altar experience. And again, it's not a piece of wood. It's a lifestyle. So we said, we got to put 10,000 in homes. We're going to put them in government buildings, even a big government building. A very well-known one. Praise God. Well, now, you said it starts at the altar. If you want to go to the secret place, if you want to hear God talk to you, it starts at the altar. Yeah. And then it goes to the secret place. Yeah. You go to the secret place at the altar. It's just you and the Lord, the intimacy. And that's when you hear from God, isn't it? That's it. That's when you know, He speaks. I saw 9-11 on a clock for six years. And I, I mean, I'd be walking through the house, see 9-11. I write about it in the book. Yeah, and I'm like, do. Lord, are you trying to warn me about, uh, are you trying to warn me about another terrorist attack, Lord? Because he's spoken to us before several of these events. A month before 9-11, the real 9-11, I'm in the middle of a park, walking through Battery Park in New York, and I grabbed my wife's hand. I said, Karen, something's about to happen here, right here. I felt the shaking in the ground. Something demonic's about to happen. So I kept seeing 9-11. Every, I, it still happens. I saw it last night. The Lord, I'll look at the clock. It'll be 
And I'm flying into Atlanta one day and it shows up on my phone. And I thought, this is it. Maybe it's a terrorist attack. And the plane went down and the pilot had to pull up. And I thought, this is it. It's something crazy. There was something in the runway. And the Lord said, son, I've been trying to call you back to Psalms 91 verse 1, the secret place. The scripture I read at 12 years old when my mother had a nervous breakdown. I read it every night. The secret place, he knit us together, Psalms 139, in the secret place. God still has scissors. He still has, and one of the word for comforters to cut away, the Holy Spirit, he still has a needle and thread. If you'll just go into your house, turn your laundry room into a secret place. Turn your bathroom into a secret place. Your locker at school into a secret place. He'll knit you back together. He'll talk to you. Amen. Wow. Amen. Wow. Amen. Yeah, that's true. Kenny's going to come back and sing for us. And then we're going to allow you to have the greatest experience of your life. Yes. Because <laughs> some of you don't know Jesus. And I don't know where this program goes goes all over the world, but you're going to have the greatest experience of your yeah. life. Amen. Kenny's going to sing for us again. Hi, I'm Brooke Larson, one of the many people that work here at CTN behind the scenes. Each day we come together to bring you Christian programming and testimonies that help you on your Christian walk. Programs that speak life, truth, healing, and change. We believe that God so loved this world that he gave his only son and that anyone that believes in his son, Jesus Christ, would not perish but have eternal life. That's why we're here today to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ across the airwaves and into your homes so that you and your family can find that same love that will set you free. Please consider partnering with us today and help us spread the gospel to every home. If each of us takes part and unites together in prayer and support, we can help change lives, communities, and nations.
hardly speak peace so unexplainable i i can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call of the book and I you can get it any place rebuilding the altar and the incredible thing is that you can do it you can rebuild the altar you may not have tools to build an altar like this but you can do it yourself yeah. Anybody can do it. That's right. You can build an altar. And you'll remember where that altar is. That's right. In years to come, you'll remember when you bowed that knee. Pat? That's true. Yes, sir. We've got five minutes to tell people about the love of God. It's so incredible. You know, my spirit is so stirred on the set today. If you're watching right now, I'm praying that God will suddenly draw near to you. He'll come to near you. My favorite altar call in the Bible is found in Luke 15. The prodigal son, had, he had gone off and made some mistakes, embarrassed his family, and the only way to come home was to be a slave. And the Jews did this thing called the kazaza. They still do it today, that if you've embarrassed the family and you come home, they run out and break a pot of burnt beans and corn on the ground in front of you and it means you're a slave. You're no longer a child of the village. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible says in verse, I believe it's 31 of Luke 15, the lost chapter, the Bible says the father takes off running. People think he ran because he missed his boy. He didn't run because he missed his boy, although he did. He actually broke the law by running. <laughs> he ran to outrun the village, <laughs> to put a coat on his boy, to put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet, to cover his nakedness and his brokenness. And God wants you to know that he's running towards you right now. That whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. If I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, that's more than just words. It means <clears> I have heart surgery. And I would be held in contempt of my office as an evangelist if I didn't tell you that God is saying enough's enough. God is saying if you will right now cry out to him, he'll tackle you like he did the son. He'll tackle you. That's a favorite altar call in the Bible is the prodigal son. He's running towards you right now. He's outrunning the accuser of the brethren for you. And he's going to make you a part of his family. How great is his love that the Father's lavish on us that I get to be called his son. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is invite. All you have to do is say, I need you, Jesus. So if you're watching, can I lead him? Yes. Please. If you're watching right now, all you have to do is this right here. 
Say, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I need you. I need you. I'm pretty messed up. I'm pretty messed up. I can't do it on my own anymore. I can't, can't do it on You are the Christ. You are the, you are the risen Savior. The risen Savior. You are the altar. The altar. The Lamb that died for me. I receive you today. I receive you today. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Wash me. Wash me. Clothe me. Clothe me. And fill me with your spirit. So da, da, da. Now I want to tell you right now, if you just pray that prayer, say this, I am a child of the King. Child of the King. It doesn't matter what I've done. See, the place you thought you would die is the place you'll dance the greatest. And what you call scars on earth, God calls testimonies in heaven. And there's a moment where you begin to realize that now you belong to Him. And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And whatever you're walking through, if you're in your home, your car at work, begin to say, Jesus, you can pray this. Jesus, let's walk together. This is the moment you just had a rebuilding of the altar moment with the encounter with God. Yes. Hallelujah. Wow. Amen. Wow, that's what happened to me. You know, I took one step toward God. I tell people now, I say that to people because one that happened step. to me. I laid in bed and it was so dark I couldn't see my hand in front of me. I couldn't go to sleep. Now, this was in my 20s. Believe me, I'm a lot older than that. I was 26, and I just said, God, in the pitch dark, God, are you really real? I went to church all my life. I had to go every time the doors opened. I went every time the doors opened. And I'm still saying, God, are you real? Jesus, are you really real? And then I said, nobody can see you. <laughs> and then I said, is heaven really real? Is hell really real? Do you know, he heard that prayer. The very next day, I see somebody with a big smile. I, in fact, every time I saw them, they had a smile on their face. And I said, can I ask you a question? Her name was Sonia. She said, yeah. I said, why are you always so happy? These were her exact words, friend. She said, I have invited Jesus Christ to come into my heart, and I haven't been the same since. So you know what? He'll do that for you. Long story short, I asked Jesus into my heart. She was a human, human billboard. Yeah. Yes. called to be a yeah. human billboard. I That's wanted true. what she had. <laughs> oh, we can't thank you enough, Pat, for yes, thank you. coming our way. And you'll be back. Yes, sir. Guarantee you. Yes. And uh, Kenny's going to close the program today with the same power. Oh, I love my friend Kenny Hope. can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face Every fear of the unknown I can hear All God's children singing out We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome The same power that rose Jesus from the grave The same power that commands the dead to wake Lives in us lives in us oh. the same power that moves mountains when he speaks the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us lives in us he lives in us lives in us we have hope that his promises are true in his strength. There is nothing we can't do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus.
raise us from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us. No weapon prevails. We stand here in victory. Oh, greater is he that is living in me. He's conquered our enemies. Oh, no power of darkness. No weapon prevails. We stand here in victory. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us, lives in us, yes. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea 